My name is Gillian Caldwell and I'm the campaign director for One Sky, which is now the largest collaborative campaign in the United States pushing for bold federal action to tackle climate change. We've got 500 allied organizations and organizers in 30 states around the country pushing for 5 million green jobs, a cap on carbon and steep science-based cuts and getting off of coal and onto renewable energy. And I'm here at uh, Copenhagen to try to push the U.S. government to emerge with the global community with a fair, ambitious and binding deal. So where are we right now? Well, the negotiations are uh, not progressing well by all accounts. Um, we're practically at a standstill. Uh, basically, I think what we could say is that um, the developing countries, uh, the Alliance of Small Island States and Africa, for example, the poorest and most marginalized countries in the world are standing firm and saying we need a fair, ambitious and binding treaty and we need to extend uh, the Kyoto Protocol and we don't accept two degrees Celsius because two degrees Celsius is going to mean three or 3.5 degrees for Africa. And we need to get back to 350 parts per million. The game has really changed the consensus around, the scientific consensus around 450, which was the IPCC assessment has changed and people understand the new number is 350. So we were basically have developing countries saying we need to get to 350 and a lot more financing and uh, industrialized countries uh, holding firm in resistance. What's the hold up? What, what's keeping these talks from moving forward? Well, of course, one of the biggest holdups is the United States, and that's why it's so critically important that advocates throughout the country are pushing our government right now. The United States has been fossilized, and otherwise they've received the highest dishonor from the NGO community worldwide here in Copenhagen for having one of the least respectable uh, offers when it comes to these negotiations. Their proposal is at this stage only to reduce carbon by 4% from 1990 levels by 2020, when what's expected is 40%. And of course, uh, putting only a few billion dollars on the table when uh, there's wide agreement, Lord Stern and others, that we need hundreds of billion to uh, adapt and support uh, the deforestation efforts and clean technology transfer. So what needs to happen? There's only, there's barely more than 72 hours left or a little bit less than 72 hours. What needs to happen between now and the possibility for a real treaty uh, breakthrough? Well, I think it's critically important that people throughout the United States are, are, are communicating with our government. At OneSky.org, we have a nationwide campaign pushing right now for the government to do what it's already said it will do, which is to redirect fossil fuel subsidies uh, towards climate towards climate adaptation. That's critically important. It could be tens of billions of dollars right there. They need to put more uh, more money on the table in terms of short, mid-term, and long-term finance. And uh, we also need Obama to come here and to commit to more than the piddly 17 percent they're hoping they can get out of the Senate. He has complementary policies. He has an EPA endangerment finding, which can help. It's not just about what the Senate may or may not deliver six months from now. What, what is it like being here? Um, you've come all the way from the United States. You've been here for over a week. Uh, what is your personal sort of uh, emotions as, as these treaty talks sort of stall and go so slowly? I, you know, I think it's incredibly sad. Um, the reality is that the world is awake for the first time in history to the damage we've done to this ecosystem and to the desperate need to get it right now. I mean, there were a hundred, there were over a hundred thousand people marching in the streets. The biggest act ever uh, rally around the need to tackle climate change in the world's history just a few days ago. And yet inside this conference center, there's a sense that we're in the land of the lost. People wander aimlessly, including parties, wondering what's happening and when, what discussions they're supposed to be a part of, how we're going to move forward. I mean, it's just, there's not a sense of collective urgency and passion to get the job done. And now with over a hundred heads of state arriving, we're almost in a waiting game until they get here but of course the heads of states have never been the one to negotiate the fine print and there's so much text that is bracketed or at this stage unresolved that it's hard to imagine how we get from here to there there being the fair ambitious and binding treaty we need to tackle climate change now well, why are so many heads of state coming when 
the outcome is so uncertain so far? Well, I think that's the only glimmer of hope is that the heads of state, first of all, committed to come weeks ago, right? This is the largest ever uh, heads of state delegation on climate change in history. It's an indication that this is that climate change is here and now and we have to tackle it. So uh, that's, that's incredibly hopeful. It's also very much the case that the heads of state simply cannot afford to go home empty handed. As Connie Hedegaard, the president of the process, said just the other day, you can leave in fame or you can leave in shame and we need the actions inside to match the actions outside. And to get there, there's going to have to be compromise. Now, when you talk about compromise with the developing countries, they say compromise is a suicide pact for us. We can't accept less than the science defines as necessary because we're literally losing our lives, in many cases, our very islands, the islands that we live on. So it's tough to talk about compromise, and I think the people we really ought to be focusing on when it comes to compromise are the industrialized nations that are largely responsible for the predicament we find ourselves in.